7 Wisdom During Temptations In the previous chapter we saw the difference between the two Greek words used for temptation and testing. Let us examine key insights from the letter of James and see how it sheds light on what our response must be in temptations. We will also see God's role in bringing us out of temptations. God is clearly vindicated as the source of temptations in this letter. The letter of James was written to Christian Jews who were having problems in their personal lives and church fellowship. They were going through difficult testings and were also facing temptations to sin. Some of the believers were catering to the rich, while others were being robbed by the rich. Church members were competing for offices in the church, particularly teaching offices. One of the major problems in their church was the failure of many to live what they professed to believe. Their tongue was a serious problem, even to the point of creating wars and divisions in the assembly. Worldliness was another problem. Some of the members were sick physically. Some were straying away from the Lord and away from church members. These issues were clearly a work of the devil and not a work of God. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Jam. 3, 16. It is in this context of all these issues, James begins his letter saying, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, purismos. Jam. 1, 2, the Greek word translated temptations here is, purismos, the same word we have been studying in the last chapter, which refers to the enticements, or temptations of the devil. The writer is exhorting the people who are going through diverse temptations to count it all joy. The Greek word translated diverse is poikilos which means manifold, various in character, thereby covering a wide array of trials and temptations. The first letter of Peter is very much in sync with what James wrote. Peter was addressing pretty much the same issues and also covers persecutions from outside the church. Both James and 1 Peter were written to the scattered. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Jam. 1, 1. To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, one pet. 1, 1. Both James and Peter are exhorting to rejoice during the temptations and trials. Poikilos and Pyrismos are the exact two Greek words translated diverse temptations, which we see below in both James 1, 2, and with, manifold temptations, in 1 Peter 1, 6. Therefore, they both are describing and addressing the same issues. We will discuss how we can have joy in times of trial shortly. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers. Temptations. Jam. 1, 2 wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. 1 Pet. 1, 6, both James and Peter talk about a trial or testing of our faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Therefore, it is obvious he is not the one testing, putting to proof, the faith which has come from him. The Greek word used in both verses below is dikimian coming from dikimos. Knowing this, that the trying, dikimian, of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Jam. 1, 3 to 4, that the trial, dikimian, of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried, Dikamazo, with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Pet 1, 7, both James and Peter advise them to not be proud, but to humble themselves and appropriate the grace of God, i.e., not to be self-reliant, but to rely upon the Lord and his strength. This was one of Job's problems. Job was proud and self-righteous, which we will discuss as we go ahead. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Jam. 4, 
6 to 7. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 1 Pet. 5, 5 to 7, both talk about the devil as an active force working against them and the instruction is to resist, oppose, and withstand the devil. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Jam. 4, 7, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that, the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. 1 Pet. 5, 8-9, By this simple analysis it must be clear to us that all the evil temptations working within the soul of a person, within a church, or a persecution coming from the outside has been a work of the evil one. The concept of trials, temptations, the trial, or trying of faith, resisting pride and humbling ourselves to receive God's grace, then resisting the devil is all quite a tough work. But, in the midst of all this the recipients are exhorted to rejoice and count it all joy. One may ask how is that possible? Well, to answer, we must know two things, first, God is not the one bringing the temptation. Second, he is busy making a way out and bringing a wonderful consummation of the trials we are in. From the previous chapter, that is what we saw in the life of Jesus. He knew God was not the author of the temptations, but that God was helping him out of it. Moreover, Jesus knew what the consummation of the temptations was going to be. We can also be assured of the consummation, or completion, through what is revealed in the Word of God. For example, if you are sick in your body, you can rest assured the consummation of the trial is healing since the Word of God already declares. By his stripes ye were healed. 1 Pet. 2, 24, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, Hebrew. 12, 2, the context of the above statement is an exhortation to resist temptations and sin, even as Jesus resisted unto the shedding of his blood. Jesus had his focus set on the joy which was us. He knew what the outcome was going to be. The end encouraged him and motivated him to endure the cross. Since his focus was not his suffering, but our salvation, he had a joy about it. Today we can have joy in the midst of our temptations, knowing how much the Father has loved us and having already provided a way out by the great things he has already done for us. We have a God who declares, the end from the beginning, and saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Isa. 46, 10, God has, in Christ Jesus, solved every situation the devil may throw at us. So the very first step is to understand God is not the tempter but our helper. It is evident to whom the epistle was speaking to. At that time, it is clear they were suffering in some form, or they were passing through temptations, and needed counsel and support. They were in danger of sinking in despondency, and of murmuring and complaining. They were also in danger of charging God as the author of temptation and sin. Therefore, James warns them, Stop being deceived, my brethren, beloved ones. James 1, 16 Woost, they were being deceived in that they were being tempted to think God was the one bringing temptations, trials, and testings in their life. They were ascribing works of the devil to God. James continues by describing the work of God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Jam. 1, 18, it does not say a few good gifts, or partially perfect gifts, but rather every good and perfect gift. He adds further information to the nature of gifts. He says, Every good and perfect gift. We are talking about the nature of a person who does not change. Mal. 
3, 10, Hebrew. 13, 8, A gift is not earned. It is given because of the love in the giver's heart. The verse further describes, the father of his own free will begot us. James 1, 18. This emphasizes a father-child relationship. No father brings evil for their children. M.T. 7, 9-11, we must think here, did the Lord in the Old Testament suddenly turn good? No. The Father has always been giving good and perfect gifts because it is his nature and he changes not. This God, whom James is describing, after the cross, and after Jesus brought a full revelation of God's nature, has been the same from the beginning. He does not change. Adam Clark in his commentary on the James 1, 17 states the following, Whatever is good is from God, whatever is evil is from man himself. As from the Son, which is the Father or fountain of light, all light comes, so from God, who is the infinite fountain, Father, and source of good, all good comes. And whatever can be called good, or pure, or light, or excellence of any kind, must necessarily spring from Him, as He is the only source of all goodness and perfection. The sun, the fountain of light to the whole of our system, may be obscured by clouds, or the different bodies which revolve round him, and particularly the earth, may from time to time suffer a diminution of his light by the intervention of other bodies eclipsing his splendor, and his apparent tropical variation, shadow of turning, when, for instance, in our winter, he is declined to the southern tropic, the tropic of Capricorn, so that our days are greatly shortened, and we suffer in consequence a great diminution both of light and heat. But there is nothing of this kind with God, he is never affected by the changes and chances to which mortal things are exposed. He occupies no one place in the universe, he fills the heavens and the earth, is everywhere present, sees all, pervades all, and shines upon all, dispenses his blessings equally to the universe, hates nothing that he has made, is loving to every man, and his tender mercies are over all his works, therefore he is not affected with evil, nor does he tempt, or influence to sin, any man. The sun, the source of light, rises and sets with a continual variety as to the times of both, and the length of the time in which, in the course of 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 48 seconds, it has its revolution through the ecliptic, or rather the earth has its revolution round the sun, and by which its light and heat are, to the inhabitants of the earth, either constantly increasing or decreasing, but God, the creator and preserver of all things, is eternally the same, dispensing his good and perfect gifts, his earthly and heavenly blessings, to all his creatures, ever unclouded in himself, and ever nilling evil and willing good. Men may hide themselves from his light by the works of darkness, as owls and bats hide themselves in dens and caves of the earth during the prevalency of the solar light, but his good will to his creatures is permanent, he wills not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may come unto him and live, and no man walks in wretchedness or misery but he who will not come unto God that he may have life. 7 James rebukes the recipients of the letter by saying, let no man say when he is tempted. Pyrazo, I am tempted, Pyrazo, of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth, Pyrazo, he any man. James 1, 13, this verse hits the nail on the head. We must take this verse very seriously, lest perhaps we be found guilty of calling evil good and good evil. Isa. 5, 20-12 thereby ascribing works of the devil unto the good Lord. If you are in a situation where you are tempted and tested with evil things, do not say, God is testing me. If you want to know the difference between the work of God and of the devil, use James 1, 17. If it is not good and perfect, it is not from God. Also, you can check Deuteronomy 28, which clearly lists blessings and curses, the good things and the evil things that can happen to you. The phrase, cannot be tempted with evil, in Greek, is apirastos esti, which is literally rendered, 
is incapable of being tempted. Some of the best expositors render, is unversed in evil things. The veracity of the statement stands on the immutable nature of God. If God can be tempted with evil, then he is no more a God. God cannot be tempted to sin. God cannot be tempted to act unrighteous. God cannot be tempted to act unbecoming of his nature, which is love. It means, God is unable to be influenced by an evil force from outside to participate with it in evil or to give the nod for evil to be done. Hab. 1, 13, this statement overthrows many people's view that Satan was able to move. God to destroy Job. Satan had tried to tempt God to do evil unto Job, to which God did not concede. It is one thing to say, God cannot be tempted with evil. However, James further says, neither tempteth he any man. This statement is just radical. It means God has nothing to do with the evil things that happen to people. God has nothing to do with the many sorrows that come people's way. God does not put sickness on you to test you. God does not cause you to lust after someone. God does not kill your babies or family members to test your faithfulness. How many accusations have ignorant men and women leveled against the good Lord? God have mercy on such. Again the very mention of the word, evil, referring to the nature of temptations in James 1, 13 verifies the fact that the purismos mentioned in James 1, 2, were not God's work. James said people were deceived in thinking that it was God who was tempting them with various situations of evil. So this is what is happening there. God has delivered the faith, the gospel concerning Jesus Christ, once and for all unto the saints. Jude 3, the enemy is out there fighting it. We are given grace for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name. Rom. 1, 5, however, the devil wants to fight it out. He wants to do all he can to pervert the faith and cause the believer to go astray. Paul had to fight the good fight of the faith. 1 Tim. 6, 12, he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. 2 Tim. 4, 7, the question we must ask ourselves is who is fighting against the faith? Who is bringing about a trial of faith? Is it the Lord, who himself is the author and finisher of the faith? Hebrew. 12, 2, no. It is the devil. Who tempted Adam and Eve to eat the fruit? Who tempted Cain to murder? Who tempted David to number Israel? Who fought against Joshua the high priest by standing at his right hand? Who tempted Jesus? Who tempted Judas to betray Jesus? Who tempted Peter to deny Jesus? Who brought destruction upon Job, and tempted him to curse God? It is not the Lord, but the tempter, who is the devil. The devil fights your faith in God and wants you to turn away from him. The first step in overcoming the temptation is knowing God is not causing it, but helping you out of it. When we are in temptations, we need the wisdom of God to overcome it. Job did not have the wisdom of God. Job 33, 45 Job did not seek God for wisdom as to why those things happened and how to come out. He just ascribed the evil to God, even as he did the good. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Jam. 1, 5 to 8, notice the exhortation to receive wisdom is within the context of the temptations they are. Suffering. We are assured God gives it to us without ridiculing or belittling us for lack of it. Later in James 3, 14 to 18, he explains the two kinds of wisdom, earthly and heavenly, and their fruits. It is earthly wisdom that causes manifold temptations. The source of earthly wisdom is the devil. 
James exhorts us to receive the wisdom of God and resist the devil. Jam. 3, 14-4, 7, The knowledge that God is not the tempter springs from heavenly wisdom. Now, let us understand what is going to happen once your faith is put to trial by the devil. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, Purismos for when he is tried, Decamos, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Jam. 1, 12, this verse so beautifully puts forth the motivation to overcome temptations. If you observe the text, Purismos is used for enduring temptations. However, Decamos is introduced in connection to receiving the crown of life. Endureth is literally, to remain under, persevere, and must be interpreted in its context, namely, the word tried. Kenneth S. Woost in his word studies from the Greek New Testament expounds this verse very in a detailed manner. He says, the word tried is from a technical Greek expression found in an earlier manuscript. It is used referring to the action of an examining board's approval for those who had successfully passed examinations for the degree of doctor of medicine. The verb means, to test for the purpose of approving. The noun means, the approved character of the one who has successfully met the test. The English word, crown is used to translate two different Greek words. Each of which speaks of a different kind of crown both of them being in common use in the first century in connection with the daily life of the people. One of the Greek words translated, crown is, diadema, from which we get our word, diadem. This Greek word is, derived from a verb meaning, to bind around. It referred to a blue band of ribbon marked with white which the Persian kings used to bind on a turban or tiara. It was the kingly ornament for the head and signified royalty. The other word, Stephanos, was the crown given to the victor in the Greek athletic games. It was given to the runner who first crossed the goal, the athlete who hurled the discus farthest, or the wrestler who pinned his opponent to the mat. It was given to the servant of the state whose work deserved to be honored. It was worn at marriage feasts. A Stephanos was therefore a symbol of victory, of deserved honor, and of festal gladness. The crown was woven of oak leaves, of ivy, of parsley, of myrtle, of olive, of violets, of roses. The word was used in the sense of a reward other than a crown. James 1, 12 talks about the Stephanos of life. Here is a child of God who has been solicited to do evil. He has successfully passed the test by refusing to sin. That is what James means by enduring temptation. The Stephanos of the life is his reward. This is not eternal life. He already has eternal life, or he could not have overcome temptation. Furthermore, this reward is given in recognition of what the believer has done. Whereas, salvation, eternal life, is a free gift given in view of what Christ has done on the cross. The article in the Greek before life, points to a particular kind of life, here to that eternal life which is in Christ Jesus that enables the believer to overcome temptation. Thus, this crown is a Stephanos given in recognition of the believer's victory over sin, that victory having been procured by means of the eternal life he has which energizes his being eight. The Woost translation of the verse is as follows, Spiritually prosperous is the man who remains steadfast under trial, because after he has met the test and has been approved, he shall receive the crown, namely, that crown which has to do with the life eternal life, which crown he promised to those who love him. In effect the verse says, when the devil brings about the temptation, the solicitation to do evil, and you stand under the testing without breaking down, the Lord is going to reward you with the crown of the life the devil brought the situation. God is working with you by giving you wisdom and making a way out. Then the Lord gives you the crown of life, like a winner's trophy, to encourage and reward you. Knowing experientially that the approving of your faith, that faith having been put to the test for the purpose of being approved, and having met the test, has been approved, that this approving process produces a patience which bears up and does not lose heart or courage under trials. 
Jam. 1, 3 to 4 Woost. Likewise, Peter also talks about this approval of faith when he says, that the trial, Dachemian, of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried, Dachemian, with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Pet 1, 7, bear in mind, the Greek word translated trial and tried in in the verse above as well as James 1, 3, 12 is the same word used for approving or certifying someone. In this case it is the approval of our faith which is to resound to the praise of the Lord Jesus. The author's line of thought is, that the trial of your faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. To make it more clear he relates with an example of gold which is certified or approved by fire. It is declared either genuine or not. The Message Bible translates it as, pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure, genuine faith put through the suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. We need to understand if the gold is not genuine, it will not become genuine by going through fire. The fire reveals what kind of a gold it is. That is the exhortation here. Peter exhorts them to display the genuine faith they have in the times of temptations. That faith is openly certified for all to see as a genuine faith. It is not the testing of our faith that is to the glory of God. It is the fact that our faith has passed. The test and been approved that brings him glory. The devil brings temptations. God wants you to pass the temptation with flying colors. He will count it praiseworthy, honorable, glorious, and display it at the appearance of Jesus Christ. It is not the approved faith, but the approval itself that is in the Apostle's mind here. For instance, a gold mining company wishes to buy a proposed site where gold is said to have been found but it is not sure whether the metal is real gold or not and whether it is there in sufficient quantity so that a mine if sunk would be a profitable venture. It engages an assayer of metals to take samples of the gold ore to his laboratory and examine them. The assayer sends his report to the effect that the ore contains true gold, and that the gold is found in sufficient quantity so that the venture will pay. The report of the assayer approving the gold ore is of far more value to the mining company than the gold he returns with his report, for upon the basis of the report, the company can go ahead with assurance and buy the land and begin mining operations. The fact that God finds our faith to be one which he can approve, is of far more value to him and to his glory, than the approved faith, for he has something to work with a faith that he knows can stand the testings and the trials which may come to the Christian. The fact that God can trust a Christian as one that is dependable, is of great value to him. 9. Let us get the whole picture now. Rejoice when the devil brings trials in your life, knowing that it is only going to make your faith prove itself genuine. Such experience will instill patience in you. It will teach you to not lose heart in such trials. Let the patience, which is nothing but faith stretched out over the period you're under the testing, run its full course. The outcome is spiritual maturity. Do not be prideful. You cannot beat the devil with natural wisdom. Rather humble yourself and receive the grace of God. While you are under the temptations, ask for wisdom. God will give it to you. Receive the heavenly wisdom and resist the devil he will flee from you. After you overcome the Lord is going to give you the crown of life. That is awesome. In order to exhort and encourage these people. Under tremendous trials and temptations, James uses the events recorded in the Old Testament. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction, and of patience. Jam. 5. 10. James wants us to take the prophets as an example, of what? Of suffering affliction and patience. A question that must be asked immediately is, who caused the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord to suffer? Definitely it was not the Lord. James, 
in writing this sentence in the context of the letter which deals with trials, temptations, and other issues, is asking them to consider the prophets as an example. It is an example of suffering affliction and of having patience which vindicates God as being the author of our sufferings. Someone might say, but God caused Job to suffer. It is awesome James talks about Job in the next verse. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy. Jam. 5, 11, the Greek word translated as both endure and patience in the verse above is one word. It is same word used in James 1, 12 where he exhorted to endure temptation. The Young's literal translation translates it as, Lo, we call happy those who are enduring, the endurance of Job ye heard of, and the end of the Lord ye have seen, that very compassionate is the Lord, and pitying. The mention of Job's endurance or perseverance sounds, not only out of place, sarcastic, but very assuring. It is for the reasons you will discover in the coming chapters as we begin dissecting the book of Job.